please excuse my hair today. It's a little bit of a mess. But I decided I wanted to film this review. I'm going to be reviewing Amethystium's second studio album called Aphelion. It was released in February of 2003, I believe. And I have already reviewed his debut album, Odonata, on this channel, which I'll link in the description below. I'm probably not going to get a ton of views on this video, as I didn't expect to. Um, he's a very unknown indie artist. He doesn't even really have a full-on Wikipedia page. I mean, that's how unknown he is. And this is sort of just an artist I really wanted to get reviews out early on, even though I have a lot of other indie artists I want to talk about, but I want to wait and see if my channel can get a little bigger before I talk about them. But I just wanted to talk about Amethystium's music because it had such a profound impact on me, and I had gotten a request to do another review. I heard Aphelion after listening to Odonata, and I feel very much like Aphelion is the progression album for Odonata. We have this sort of narrative or story arc of the dragonfly carried through not just in the album artwork as you can see, but sort of in the overarching story that I'm starting to kind of pull from these songs. Even if the order may not always make sense, I can sort of construe a kind of overarching narrative, at least within these 11 songs themselves. What I find with Aphelion that makes it possibly my favorite record of his is there's a much more refined and more detailed and complex sound to this record than Odonata. Odonata felt in some ways, I don't like using the word juvenile, but it felt in some ways like he really was, you know, 17, 18, 19, and he had just gotten some programming equipment and was using some more kind of more basic um, simpler structures of beats and electronic samplings. I feel with Aphelion, he's able to, even though I think he did record some of the songs for this record around the same time as Odonata, he was able to refine and explore his sound in a more intricate way. There are, the microbeats are so much richer on this album, and for, there's much more variety of uh, electronic samplings and mixing going on. There's so much more smoother kind of transitions. I feel like this album feels a lot more cohesive in that regard, just because it feels more like it's telling a story in a more sort of grandiose way. Whereas Odonata felt like these very distinct electronic songs that were all very interesting, but also very different from one another in a lot of respects. No, that's not to say that this album doesn't have a lot of variety. We still have a lot of Eastern influences on this record. In fact, even more so, I would say, Chinese and Japanese traditional instruments are used on this record, along with Indian for the first time as well, on Garden of Sakuntala. I want to just highlight that song, Garden of Sakuntala, as it is a perfect example of a blend of Indian music with a very sort of almost Bhangra-type beat at parts that feels much like a dance song, but is also so elevated and spiritual. Um, it's a spiritual song that you can dance to, and it is so overlayered. It, I don't want to say overlayered like it's a bad thing. It is just so all around you. I mean, there's a lot of these beautiful vocals that are sort of humming in the background, and you really get a sense of a choral presence on a lot of these songs. And then, of course, there's those beautiful flutes that he, of course, employs more and more. These flutes just carry this soaring melody so beautifully on all of these songs. And like I said, the beat and the production is so much more rhythmic and strong, though there was a great amount of rhythm on Odonata. I'm not denying the rhythmic appeal there either. Garden of Sakuntala is based off of a, a Hindu tale, and I just feel like it was just, it took the story and it just elevated it and just made it so interesting. There's other songs like Ad Astra, for example, which also feel very much like it's telling a story. The song feels as very much like it is being propelled to go to the stars, as it means in Latin. Um, the song has some very distorted, strange vocals in the background, which we also hear in a song called Shadow Into Light. Shadows Into Light is a beautiful opener for this record. It sets the tone with the most ominous, overlayered choral presence that's very murky, that's very unsure of itself. And the song, just almost like a baby trying to go from crawling to standing, slowly finds its footing. It slowly finds its rhythm as it carries through in a more positive direction to the point where at the end you're just swept up in this very melodic rhythm. And then there's these, again, very eerie chantings that sound very distinct, very Eastern, um, very throatal, I don't know how else to describe it, um, and very unorthodox, but it's not too loud that it asserts itself 
beyond the rest of the soundscape that's around it. It's just sort of there to kind of add intrigue, to sound as though you're entering a space where there's unknown entities or unknown voices all around you. It's just in the keyboard progression. It's just so positive. There's a song called Hymnody, which again, makes a tear come to your eye when you think of this positive melodic progression. Um, it's just so triumphant. Um, there is a lot of bittersweet going on as well, and a perfect example of that bittersweet would be Withdrawal, the penultimate song on this record. One of the most mournful, spaced out, ambient electronic songs I have ever heard that definitely employs a lot of Japanese influence. This song just reeks of sadness and forlorn and lamentation. And it feels a lot like the feeling of withdrawal. I think aphelion as a title references the time when the Earth is furthest away from the Sun in its orbit, which, believe it or not, it may sound strange, but actually happens around July, not in December. This isn't about what part of the Earth is facing the Sun. This is about in the orbit around the Sun that the Earth goes through, um, the point where it gets the furthest away, because remember, Earth is not, you know, perfectly circling the Sun. Um, there's the opposite, which is perihelion, when it's the closest, I believe that's what it is called. Um, so aphelion kind of is emphasizing that yearning to find light. As the title, I mean, as the intro track will portray and the album cover as well, this album is about coming from the darker places and asking for the closeness or warmth of light, or in my opinion, some sort of idea of God source or spiritual connection with the universe. There's a song called Bear Cues, which closes out this record, which is so beautiful. And it definitely feels like the most calming, zen-like song ever of her of his created. And then it just breaks into a very charming, very idyllic, beautiful, playful melody with a keyboard, which just feels so at peace and at one and in harmony. Just a beautiful way to close out this record and the sweeping synths that are so light and so delicate that feel like waves crashing over you just feels like this embodiment of peace. And I feel like it was perfect to end the album with that song because of it. We have another song called Shibumi, which is very Japanese inspired as the name itself would reference. And this song is a bit more interesting in its production. It has a lot of sort of interesting bass production. And I would reference it again to say it's sort of like an answer, a sister song, The Garden of Sakuntala. Whereas that song was more Hindi referenced, this song is more Buddhist and Shinto influenced. It's a bit like a dance song, but it's like spiritual Japanese or Chinese music. It could even be Korean, although the title is in Japanese. So it sort of does the heavy lifting there for us to guess where this is culturally deriving from. Shibumi in Japanese means a basically an aesthetic of simple, subtle, and unobtrusive beauty. Um, a kind of a, like think feng shui, um, something that is just very pleasant to look at, um, and it feels whole and complete in its presence. The song I have to talk about, and I'd be remiss to men not mention, is my favorite on this record, Autumn Interlude. Autumn Interlude is one of the most ethereal songs that Amethystium, as his name is actually Oystein Riemfjord, he's a Norwegian producer by the way, in case I forgot to mention that at the beginning here, the most ethereal song that he has created. And this song, when I heard it, just solidified my love and appreciation for his, for his sound. It starts out with this very beautiful choir just sort of humming the ambient sort of backings to this song with all of the sort of more uh, electronic glitchy sounds coming through. Um, and there's a bit of a mournful tinge to the whole thing. And then it kind of swoops into this very choral moment where it sounds like they're singing Brea. I'm not entirely sure if it's meant to mean anything. Um, I don't really care too much about the lyrics until we get to the female vocalists and we have the one time of female vocals on this album. Such pure vocals that are so bittersweet and beautifully composed. Feels like I could reach up into dark October skies, scoop up seven of Orion's stars, hold them like shiny diamonds. Then I turn and return to a world less than I'd like it to be. Strange thoughts staring at the stars on an autumn's night. These lyrics just perfectly encapsulate the essence and emotion of feeling one with the universe, but also this mystery when you're 
in nature, you're immersed in it and you're feeling all the energy around you. It's sort of like this ecstatic spiritual revelation that the character can have with this connection to the world. And it's so bittersweet and so melancholy because, you know, people may think, well, oh, why is it strange thoughts? It's, it's happy thoughts, right? Well, it's not necessarily because there's all this existential confusion. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to translate or describe the emotions that come from this sort of bittersweet feeling of oneness with everything. It's happy tears, you know, and this song embodies that sort of essence of happy tears. The song following is called Elven Song, and it creates a very lush soundscape of ethereal, as again, more flutes and more of those distorted vocals to kind of create a fairyland-like universe. Um, it's a great progression from songs off of his first record where he was hinting at trying to create music that felt so esoteric and so kind of alien. Um, this does have an alien quality to it and at the same time has some glimmers of dance. Some people may consider music like this to be a bit like elevator music, but I don't think songs like these are simplistic enough to be in that category. I can't listen to them as elevator music. I hear so much um, each time I listen, so many different, so much I hadn't recognized before. And it really is nice when you kind of take a break from this music and come back to it. Um, Exaltation is another song I haven't mentioned. It's a bit longer. It sort of drags in parts. It's the one song I'm not 100% crazy about, I would suppose, along with Ad Astra. These two songs are interesting, they're darker, they're murkier, they're not as triumphant, though Exaltation does have a moment where it breaks and it feels like the sun is breaking through at one point, hence the title. And then we have one other song called Gates of Morpheus. This song is very distinct from all of the others. Morpheus is considered to be one of the Greek gods of dreams, I believe, and so this is sort of about being asleep and about the subconscious mind. And this song is very much like that. It's very subliminal. It's very... Uh, outer space. It's very cosmic feeling. Um, it definitely feels a lot like more on the ambient side than all the other songs, which are a little bit more on the electronic dance element. It's not necessarily a bad thing, though I do feel like the song kind of is just there and it's not that memorable. It gets drowned out by songs that actually have this triumphant motif in them. Songs that are don't have so much melody and are sort of just this more interesting conglomeration of sounds hearkening to artists so much like Enigma, for example. Gates of Morpheus is definitely a Enigma sounding track. So fans of Enigma, you will love Gates of Morpheus, along with probably Ad Astra as well. These two songs are definitely pointing in that direction, along with other artists, New Age artists like Delirium. What really sets Amethystium apart is this unique blend of what I would consider spiritual nature sounds. And I feel like the choral ethereal moments that this record has are what make it stand out the most. And I think those are the moments that make this record special, not so much the moments where it may sound like he's rehashing territory that other big new age artists like Enigma have done before. Overall, I would say this is my favorite Amethystium record, though it is really hard because Odonata is right up there. Both of these records have songs that I love in the same amounts. Um, even though Odonata is a little bit longer, those are shorter songs. They add up to be about the same length. And there's songs on both of them that are great. It's hard for me to put one above the other. They're both in equal standing, though I will say that all of the rest of his albums don't come close to these two. So I had to just give it a shout out. Um, I hope you enjoyed this review, and if anyone is familiar with Amethystium and wants to shed some more light, because unfortunately he does not give a lot of interviews, he is very vague about his music, well, you know, he's not that well known, um, it would be great to discuss that, um, because I am just so interested in his his thought processes and what the visuals are that inspires the music for him. Gosh, this was a shorter review, but when there's no lyrics, it's a lot harder to analyze these songs. I mean, as far as the sonic landscape, again, there's just all sorts throughout the board. We've got all of these neat old fashioned instruments. We've got the choral chants. We've got all the electronic keyboard workings, the samplings, the distorted vocals. We've got it all there, and it's just so interesting to sweep yourself in. I highly recommend listen to it with headphones, because that's how it really gets and surrounds you. Really dive into this record. You will not be sorry. It will take you on a mythical journey through deep forests and through, you know, and through fields of imagination and wonder. Thank you so much for watching. Peace, love, and light. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Have a wonderful day. Bye.